So my name is Chidin Mawobe. I am a clinical anatomy research fellow here at the Se Seattle Science Foundation, and I will be presenting on the etiology of entrapment neuropathy of the ulnar nerve in the forearm. Um, so just to give you guys a brief outline, what I'll be speaking on is entrapment syndrome, and then a brief review of ulnar nerve anatomy, lesions of the ulnar nerve, the etiology, relevance, and then future works. So entrapment syndrome is pretty much just a compression or direct pressure on a nerve um, from a surrounding structure. It may be asymptomatic, or it can present with symptoms. And in nerve entrapment syndromes are very, very common in the upper limb. Um, and the incidence is likely to increase with risk factors such as age, uh, diabetes, and obesity become uh, more prevalent in the general population. So the most common cause of overall entrapment in the upper limb is carpal tunnel syndrome, which we all know is an, it's an impingement on the median nerve in the flexor retinaculum, by the flexor retinaculum, excuse me, in the carpal tunnel. Um, and then the second most common is entrapments of the ulnar nerve. So we have the two most common ulnar nerve entrapments being the cubital tunnel, um, in the cubital tunnel and within Guyen's canal. And ulnar nerve within the forearm itself, so within these two boundaries, is quite atypical because in the forearm, this nerve is very mobile. So the ulnar nerve, as I'm sure we all know, arises from the medial cord of the brachial plexus, that's roots C8 and T1, and it courses along the medial side of the arm. Um, before reaching the forearm, it'll pass through the medial epicondyle, and then in the forearm, it exits the cubital tunnel, and then courses through the heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle, and then travels alongside the, the ulna. In the wrist, it'll travel superficially to the flexor retinaculum, and then traverse Guyen's canal and give rise to superficial and deep branches. So as I said before, the spinal roots are T C8 to T1, and it arises from the medial cord, and it has many motor functions, primarily in the hand. However, in the forearm, it does innervate the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle and the medial one half of the flexor digitorum profundus. Um, and it gives sensory innervation to the medial one and a half digits of the hand and the palmar surface associated with it. So lesions of the ulnar nerve and the elbow usually present with paralysis of the muscles that it innervates and um, sensory paralysis of the skin that it innervates. So usually when you have a lesion, you expect to see a deficit in these areas. The characteristic signs are an inability of a patient to grip paper between the, the fingers, and that's because the ulnar nerve innervates the dorsal interossei muscles. Um, and you also have a positive Froman sign because of inability to adduct the thumb. And you have a claw hand at rest because of paralysis of the medial lumbricals. So at the wrist, the presentations of ulnar neuropathy, or excuse me, ulnar paralysis are pretty much the same. Um, it's just that the claw hand is more prominent at rest. Um, and so lesions of the ulnar nerve uh, have been classified by Shane McLean through three systems. The one that we'll be most focused on is type one, motor and sensory abnormalities in Guyen's canal or proximal to it. And we're more concerned about the lesions that are proximal to Guyen's canal. So our area of focus is, um, our proximal boundary is Osborne's ligament, which is the roof of the cubital tunnel, um, and it'll form our proximal boundary. So anything distal to Osborne's ligament and anything proximal to the Pistohamate ligament, which is the proximal boundary of Guyen's canal, is going to be our focus. And this is mainly because cubital tunnel syndrome um, has been very, very well researched, as has um, Guyen's canal syndrome. So we don't really want to focus on that. We want to focus on a little more atypical presentations of the ulnar nerve entrapment. So the etiology, there are various etiologies of ulnar nerve entrapment within the forearm. So I split it up into um, separate sections. We have neoplasms, anatomical structures and variations, trauma and disease processes. So for the neoplasms, there are quite a few, but I selected the most prevalent and decided to present it today. So the most present, um, prevalent neoplasm in the forearm was neurolamoma or schwannoma. And so these are benign proliferations of the nerve sheath, and it's usually encapsulated by epineurium. So it's separate from the nerve itself. Um, it's the most common primary nerve tumor, and it's very important because it arises most commonly in the hand and wrist region, which is part of the region of our focus today. Um, it often presents with symptoms of neuro neuropathy, so that's pain, paresthesia, muscle weakness, 
Um, so those are the symptoms that you'll see if a patient has a neurolumoma specifically in this area. And if you can see uh, the upper picture, that dilation on the arm, that's a neurolumoma. And then the bottom picture is just a dissected um, forearm. And you can see the neurolumoma within the ulnar nerve itself. Um, so as I stated before, encapsulation of the nerve, uh, encapsulation of the tumor itself allows um, easy extraction from the parent nerve. So usually when patients present with neurolumomas, it's most simple just to re um, retract the uh, tumor itself in order to help the patient gain full motor abilities and full sensory abilities after resection. And now other soft tissue tumors include lipomas, lipofibromatous hamartomas, neurofibromas, and giant cell tumors. And if you can see the picture over there, um, the top picture, it shows a star. And that's a dilated ulnar nerve because of a proliferation of an LFH. And then at the bottom, it's a congenital LFH that presented with macrodactyly due to um, rapid proliferation of the hamartoma. And so, as it says on the slide, proliferation of these structures can entrap and cause macrodactyly. So you're really presenting with two um, classes of very, very distinct symptoms. Um, another neoplasm that can present in the forearm is perineurofibromatosis. So these are benign, non-encapsulated, tumor-like infiltrative proliferations of mature fibrous tissue. Um, often, grossly, they look to be malignant, but when you do histological examination, you can see that these aren't actually malignant. Um, so as you can see in the bottom picture, um, the perineural fibromatosis has actually impinged on the ulnar nerve, and in this patient, they presented with classic symptoms of neuropathy. So again, pain, paresthesias, and numbness in the sensory distribution of the ulnar nerve. So anatomical structures and variations can also cause um, entrapment syndrome in the forearm via the ulnar nerve. Um, the most common muscular entrapments happened with the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, which if you remember, the ulnar nerve travels between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. So it's a very, very probable place for this nerve to be entrapped. It's been cited as a possible etiology of entrapment and duplication of the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon and splittering of the ulnar nerve has also been reported. Um, in patients with a variation in the deep flexor pronator aponeurosis, that has also served as a point of compression. So if you can see below, in between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris, you have the deep flexor pronator aponeurosis, and that can either hypertrophy or stretch and cause compression of the ulnar nerve. Um, there's also a muscular variation in the palmaris longus that can cause entrapment of the ulnar nerve. So I'm sure as most of you know, the palmaris longus is one of the most variable muscles um, in the body. About 14 to 30% of the population has no palmaris longus. Um, and in cases when it's reversed, bifid, duplicated, or triplicated, it can actually impress on both the um, median nerve and the ulnar nerve and cause symptoms of paresthesia. And the bottom picture over there shows a reversed ulnar nerve, or excuse me, a reversed palmaris longus, as well as duplication of the abductor digiti minimi muscle, um, which caused two points of um, impingement on the ulnar nerve. The vasculature um, can also present with entrapment syndrome, although this is fairly rare. Um, there have been traumatic aneurysms in the forearms, intraneural AV malformations, and um, ulnar artery thrombosis, all which have entrapped the ulnar nerve and also presented with um, symptoms of pain, paresthesia, and motor and sensory deficits. Um, above, we're looking at the intraneural arterial venous malformation. If you can see the arrow, it points to um, the AV malformation right there. And then more distal to that is the um, regular ulnar nerve. And then below is a histological specimen of what was seen in the AV uh, malformation. So trauma is a likely culprit for ulnar nerve entrapment also. It's also one of the most common causes of ulnar nerve entrapment in the forearm. So fractures are a fairly atypical um, presentation of compression in regards to the ulnar nerve, only because it's very, very mobile in the forearm. Um, but all reported cases of ulnar nerve entrapment due to fractures were reported as closed fractures. So there was no um, 
exposing a bone within the forearm. And it's most common after fractures of the distal radius. Um, so as you can see above, there was a distal radial fracture and it caused a severe radial deviation of the ulnar nerve. And then below, uh, there's scar entrapment of the ulnar nerve. So these are the two most likely um, causes of entrapment due to fractures. So the issue with um, fractures and entrapment syndrome is that they're often misdiagnosed. Um, physicians can diagnose it as neuropraxia, expecting motor and sensory deficits to go away within six to eight weeks, but then patients present three to four months later with uh, severe nerve palsy, often atrophy of the muscle supplied by the ulnar nerve. And uh, this becomes an issue because if it, if it can be addressed early on, it should be. Um, and often overlooking this can lead to uh, worse outcomes. So neurolysis is indicated is, as a treatment of a progressive palsy after bone entrapment. And the great thing about fractures and ulnar nerve entrapment is although it's very traumatic, um, majority regain motor function within a year. And it's about 90 to 100% of regaining of motor function. That bottom picture below just shows a radial head and it's sitting on the ulnar nerve. So um, there are many different disease processes that are um, indicated in ulnar nerve entrapment in the forearm. However, one that came up very commonly um, was synovial chondromatosis. And pretty much what synovial chondromatosis is, is a metaplasia of the synovium to cartilaginous material that can ossify to bone. So it's kind of like joint mice and osteoarthritis. Um, the cartilaginous material will ossify and it'll cause stiffness of the joint. And those, um, the little bodies inside the synovium can actually impinge on um, structures around the area. And in our case, it can impinge on the ulnar nerve within the forearm. So patients will present with the classic symptoms associated with synovial chondromatosis, but then they'll also present with classic symptoms of neuropathy. So they're experiencing double the pain, double the paresthesia uh, localized to a specific region. So it commonly arises at the elbow. That is the most common place, but there have been reports of synovial chondromatosis in the pisotriquetral joint. And usually um, the indicated treatment is a partial synovectomy to remove the cartilaginous bodies, and that usually refer, restores function. So the relevance is that treatment of a nerve, nerve injury varies with the type of nerve injury. We can't expect to treat, for example, neuropraxia um, when a patient actually has an ulnar nerve lesion. So it's very important to accurately identify exactly what a patient has in order to give them the optimal treatment that's conducive to recovery. Um, and the forearm itself has been an underrecognized re region in terms of ulnar nerve entrapment, and better understanding of this area allows for better outcomes in patients. Um, so in the future, um, it would be really, really great to do a, a literature review to further elucidate when it's necessary to do nerve exploration um, and when conservative treatment is best, because that was often um, a point of contention in the literature. From 1968 until now, there hasn't really been um, a standard or um, a set amount of guidelines in order to indicate when conservative treatment is best for optimal recovery and when interventional treatment is best for optimal recovery. And in terms of neoplasms, because neoplasms such as neurolomomas and schwannomas can often be uh, mistaken for ganglion cysts, it would be very good to de develop a standard methodology for the diagnosis of lesions in the forearm. And also evaluating structural variants of the forearm would be very conducive to the body of knowledge that cause, um, of things that cause ulnar entrapment. And yeah.